How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on the show, Jane Mayer, staff writer for The New Yorker and author of the best-selling book, Dark Money, the hidden history of the billionaires behind the rise of the radical right. She reveals the fossil fuel industry's campaign to undermine action on climate change. I would argue that the best example of the influence money has in politics or in this country is, is climate change um, policy. Mayor details the strategies Charles and David Koch employ to protect their oil and gas empire. Up next on Climate One. In 2008, Barack Obama and uh, John McCain basically had the same position on climate change. It's something we can fix. We need to do it. Uh, in 2012, it did not play in the campaign at all. There was, cl there was climate silence. 2016, there was polarization. Uh, Clinton and Trump being in very different places. How much of that is due to the funding from the people you've been writing about? I, I would argue that the best example of the influence money has in politics or in this country is, is climate change um, policy. Because it starts out with going back with, you know, from Nixon and the early, and the Bush presidencies. Uh, environmental policy was, in the very beginning, a bipartisan issue. And, and what's happened is it's been captured um, by one party, this, this anti-climate change push comes from the Republican Party, which is funded by the fossil fuel industry. And they have focused their efforts on that, and they've really moved the whole party in their direction with money. Um, and that you now have, uh, there was a chart that the New York Times ran very recently, I don't know if people saw it, but if you take a look, at, it's a graph of the whole country, and it shows what opinion on climate change is. And all across the country, in almost every, every state, every county, people in this country believe climate change is real, it's a danger, it's caused by man-made activities, and we should do something about it. I live in Washington, D.C., where the Congress is, and where Scott Pruitt is the EPA director. It's almost the only place that has exactly the opposite point of view. And there's really no other explanation for it except the money that's going into those people's pockets. I'm sorry. Between 2005 and 2008 alone, Coke, the Koch family put $25 million into funding denial of climate change. They were described by Greenpeace as kingpins of denial in this country. Between 2003 and 2010, according to Robert Brule, who's a, a, a professor at Drexel, who's followed the money on climate change, there was $500 million in this country put into denial of climate change. Um, a lot of that came from the Kochs. So Jane, you start uh, the book with, uh, focusing on the Koch brothers and note that these libertarians uh, inherited a fortune that was made in part by doing business with two of history's most notorious dictators, Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Connect those dots for us. Well, um, the, the father in the family, Fred Koch, figured out a, a new way to refine oil in this country, and he had a hard time selling it. The major oil companies were kind of blocking him. And so he, in order to make money, took his discovery elsewhere. And the first thing he did was build up uh, the Soviet Union's oil business for Stalin. And then I was trying to figure out what this family was about and get the family stories, and somebody said to me, well, then the father went over to Germany to do some work, and it was sort of the late 1930s, and I was thinking, Germany in the late 1930s, that's a strange time and place to be working. So I started digging a little bit deeper, and sure enough, it turned out that he and a partner were building a refinery 
that had to be greenlighted by Hitler and that became very important to the Hitler war effort in World War II, according to all kinds of um, historians and, that I interviewed about World War II and, and military industrial history. So, um, so the father, not only that, but when you're doing a book like this, you really don't know what you're going to find. But not only had the father gotten this um, refinery built for Hitler, but he had been quite impressed with the German culture and brought back a nanny to raise the Koch brothers, who turned out to be a Nazi. So I was thinking, you know, how often do you get a Nazi nanny for the two of the <laughs> <laughs> you know, billionaires who were dominating American politics? It was kind of like one of those days when you're sitting alone on a book and you think, oh, God, thank you. Um, <laughs> this is just too interesting. I can't wait to tell people this story. So. And you write that there's someone who worked for the Koch family, Clayton Coppin, who actually connected this father figure with some of the ideology of the family. Well, yeah. So Clayton Coppin was, he was actually at first a libertarian himself and a professor of history. And he was hired by the Koch family to do a kind of a, a secret biography of the first of the company and then of the family. And, um, so he, he went through all the papers in the family and letters and interviewed people, and he came up with this theory that I thought was very interesting about why Charles Koch is such an ardent libertarian. And his thought was that Charles's father, Fred, was this overbearing sort of John Wayne-like character who was very tough on these boys, and that, um, and that Charles was attracted to an ideology that had, that sort of crushed all all kinds of rules and limits. Libertarianism, he had this ideal of no rules, no government. The government was, in his, according to Clayton Coppin, the final thing that could stop him after his father. And so he wanted to just tear it all down. I don't, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know if that's a fair interpretation. I was not able to interview uh, Charles and David Koch, but I thought it was certainly worth noting that that a man who spent a number of years doing a, a kind of a secret history of the family for the family came up with this theory, and I, yeah, it's fascinating. So they inherit this money, and they actually uh, kind of sort of came sideways into their political activism. It was kind of a, for tax planning reasons, you write. It wasn't like that they had political ambitions. Like they had all this money, they had to find tax efficient ways to use it, and they started giving it away to these organizations. So tell us how they got involved in politics. Well, so they first they were raised by their father Fred, who became extremely anti-communist after working with Stalin and seeing people he knew were were killed and sent off to gulags. And so he came back to this country and helped found the John Birch Society. Um, and, and the boys were raised in that environment. And, 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 and Charles and David were both members of the John Birch Society as young men. So they were kind of inculcated in, in their worldview. But they also had inherited hundreds of millions of dollars, each, each of these boys did. There were four in the family, actually. And, and th their father's estate planning hit upon a mechanism, which was if you could put away uh, some of the money and, and donate the interest to charity, you could avoid paying inheritance taxes. And so rather than just giving it to you know, um, some exist United Way or some existing charity, they created a family foundation. And they gave the money to that and then, and then started pouring that into conservative causes. So it made them, and, and, and David Koch has talked about this, he, he became a philanthropist for um, tax reasons to avoid um, inheritance taxes. And they found that it gave them a lot of influence to give away that kind of money um, every year makes you have a, a super loud voice in this country. And, and they kind of liked it. What kind of cloak of secrecy is there around the Koch empire? There's a lot of secrecy. Um, they'll talk to people who they feel are going to you know, give them good publicity. But I think they didn't think that was going to be me. Um, <laughs> and so I had a very hard time getting cooperation from them. And, and part of the reason the book took five years was it, it took a number of years to get sources. I did finally get sources on the inside, but I really can't 
describe them without compromising sources, mm -hmm. but um, it wouldn't have been possible to tell the story in the kind of detail I did without cooperation from people. The Koch brothers used to operate, and this whole organization used to operate in, in darkness, largely thanks to you and your reporting. There's a lot more light on it now. How has that changed the way it operates, that there's more scrutiny? Well, they've, they've actually, <laughs> they've, they've done a lot to try to improve their image. Um, and. And it's been interesting to watch. Um, luckily, there was, particularly after 2012, when they put a ton of money into trying to elect Romney um, and defeat Obama. And when that didn't work out, um, they went back to the drawing board to try to figure out what went wrong. And um, what's interesting is they had a meeting with a number of the big donors that they work with, um, whose money were, was being pooled, and there was a tape that leaked of the discussion, and and it's it's almost comic. At some point, they say, you know, what we've 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 discovered from they did all these focus groups and polling and stuff, and and they came back and they said, you know, people think we're greedy. Um, and, uh, and, uh, How much did that cost? They don't trust yeah. us, and so the, so they actually uh, embarked on a, a, a pretty large image renovation project that included, and you can hear it when you listen to this tape, um, they talk about what they've discovered they need to do is form unlikely alliances with people who, who um, the public wouldn't expect them to work with and to do things that look like they're, they're not self-interested. So it was pretty soon after that that they started talking about criminal justice reform, which has become one of their big issues, and working with um, a number of black leaders um, putting money into um, the, the historically black colleges and the United Negro College Fund, and, and they've, they've been working on this. And I mean, you could be cynical, I'm probably somewhat cynical about this, and think, you know, this is all in, the, in you know, working towards cleaning up their image and trying to be more effective politically. But at least they are putting some money into some good causes while they're you know, serving their own cause. I mean, what the Kochs did, and it's interesting to look at at this point when people are sort of throwing up their hands and saying, well, what can we do in this country? Um, they, they have a very interesting, and, and it, for them it was an effective playbook, which was they went local. They, they started in a place that was way, way far out on the right fringe of American politics, so far out that, that William F. Buckley called them anarcho-totalitarians. Um, and so they, they, had, they, they, they had no ability to really have much power from where they were. But they've moved in those, the years since about 1980 till now, they've moved their vision to the center of the Republican Party and really captured the Republican Party in many ways. And so how did they do it? One of the things they did was they went local. They went to state legislatures where their money went further and they, they um, pushed candidates that shared their view. Um, they funded campaigns on the local level and they, they pushed their legislation in the state legislatures where it doesn't take that much money to try to sort of buy off a legislator um, or convince a legislator, to put it. <laughs> um, and so, um, and, and, and they, they, they worked at it and worked at it and, and 2010 was really their killer year for t taking over state legislatures and it was a particularly strategic one and they knew this at the time. 2010 was the year that, um, that there was a new census, every, they come out every 10 years, and the legislatures were gerrymandering the congressional districts after that. And so they knew if you could put Republicans in all these state legislatures in the majority, they would draw up the congressional districts for the next 10 years, and they did, and they gerrymandered districts all over the country that have given you know, wonderful advantages in places like North Carolina to the, to the conservative Republican candidates. Um, and so, you know, you look at this playbook and um, you can see you could learn a lot from it, really. Um, and, and it, you know, anyway, I think it's, it, it's instructive to see how they did it. And it's interesting that both Arnold Schwarzenegger and Barack Obama out of office are focusing on redistricting in that area, playing a little bit of catch up with the Koch brothers. The Democrats were, I have to say, asleep at the switch on this one. Up next. It's not just the Koch brothers who go to bat for fossil fuels in Washington. The Mercer family is in the inner circle of the Trump administration. And Jane Mayer's story begins with the patriarch, Bob. 
Let's talk a little bit about uh, Bob Mercer. Uh, he was a Cruz supporter who switched to Trump. One of the people you interviewed in your recent New Yorker article said Trump would not be president were it not for uh, Bob Mercer. So tell us about him and his daughter. Sure. Um, the person who said that is Nick Patterson, who is someone who worked with Bob Mercer for many years at a hedge fund that Bob Mercer runs, Renaissance Technology. Um, Bob Mercer is a brilliant, brilliant uh, computer scientist and mathematician who used to work at IBM where he um, and a team did the kind of preliminary work for Google Translate. They figured out how you could use computers to take all the jumble of data that language is and translate one language into another. Um, they then, um, he was recruited by a hedge fund that thought, well, maybe you could use those same skills to take the jumble of data in the stock markets and the commodities markets and, and, and take a computer and write algorithms that would allow you to predict how the markets are going to move, um, give you the jump as traders on other traders. And so um, it's worked fantastically. Um, Renaissance Technologies is, a, is it's based in Long Island. It's a, it's a small and very secretive hedge fund that has been described by many financial um, publications as the most lucrative hedge fund in the world. Um, and Bob Mercer is the co-manager of it at this point. And his daughter, Rebecca Mercer, uh, was described as one person as the first lady of the alt-right. That is what um, another conservative said that she wants to be. Bob Mercer's got a daughter who's about, I think she's 43 years old now. And her, what, what happened when this family got so rich, um, they, were, they were, you know, kind of ordinary, middle class, very brainy family, but the kids went to public school and they didn't live in a fancy house. And, um, but when the father got to this hedge fund and it started minting money, he, he, he started earning what people think is about $135 million a year. And he had, um, it allowed him and the family to kind of indulge their wildest dreams. And um, among the dreams was really changing the direction of American politics. And that's his daughter is the political activist in the family. And she's wanted to really change the kind of politics we have in the country. From the, again, they want to push it way off to the kind of libertarian far right. Uh, these people have more money than, than you know, you can, anyone can imagine. What motivates them? Is it money? Is it love? Is it power? You know, I, the, one of the things that, that's, that struck me when I was writing about them was, and people have said about, um, for instance, about Trump, that you, he can't be doing this for money because he's got enough money. But, 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 or, but what I discovered with a lot of these people is for many of them, there's never enough money. Um, and it's not really about money for, you know, for getting, um, you know, the groceries or whatever. It's, it's, the money is a measure of their success and power and maybe the, their acclaim and who knows, maybe it's their father's love, whether or not they got enough in the inheritance. Um, I mean, there's one woman whose story I love in the book. She's a minor figure, but she, her name is Susan Gore of the Gore-Tex family. And um, she was very rich, and they were dividing up the inheritance in her family on the basis of how many kids each, each of the siblings in the family had. And um, she had one less child than the other siblings. So she literally went to court to try to adopt her ex-husband. Um, <laughs> and and um, it went through many rounds. Eventually, it was ruled Ill not a legitimate strategy. <laughs> but, <laughs> I wonder how much she was going to pay him to say, yeah, let me ad adopt you. Um, what is the relationship of these people? Some of them call Trump a clown. Uh, many of them, as you write, Bob Mercer did not support Trump, but some of them supported Mike Pence first. What's the relationship with Trump? With, with which one? With the Mercers or with, Mercers, with the yeah, other? The, I mean, group. it's the, the, so the Kochs bought by, by this last year, by 2016, they had very high hopes of finally putting in someone in the White House who would be kind of their candidate. Um, and they'd put together a group of major conservative donors that 
that had pledged $889 million that they were going to spend in this last election cycle. And they were just waiting for the Republican nominee to emerge. And as you remember, what were there, 17 different candidates? Um, and they pretty much could have lived with almost any of them except Trump. Um, and the wrong one came out from their standpoint. And so they were kind of had a crisis. Um, and they started pouring their money instead into congressional, gubernatorial, Senate races, and even lower level races all over the country instead. Um, so they've had a kind of a, a, a complicated relationship with Trump. Many of the people that they have um, worked with and even some of their funders um, from their group, such as Betsy DeVos, are now part of the Trump administration. And, and there's more and more reporting that's coming out. There was just something recently that shows how many people are you know, in senior levels in the Trump administration who were previously working for the Kochs. And there are a lot of them. I've got to say, Mike Pence, in, in 2012, when Charles Koch was trying to figure out who he would really want to have run for president, Mike Pence was his number one choice. So um, Pence is someone that they love. And Mark Short, who's working for Mike Pence in the White House, I, think, I can't remember if he's his chief of staff or some top job for Mike Pence, ran the Koch's um, money business, their whole political money operation until you know, a year and a half ago. So you've got people in there who, who are kind of Coke people. Um, but, but Trump himself is not their kind of, um, of politician. For, for one thing, he, they feel he's not um, conservative enough. They feel that he, you know, he supports big, uh, expensive programs like Social Security and Medicare. And that's big government from their standpoint that they want to get rid of. Um, so, Mercer, on the other hand, um, Rebecca Mercer and Bob Mercer became the funders who really saved Trump's neck in the final round of the campaign. Trump was really in, in rocky shape in the very end. It was after that tape came out, the Access Hollywood tape, his uh, chief, his, his, the man that was running his campaign, Paul Manafort, had to quit under, you know, with, with one headline after another tying him to Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs. It was a mess. And, um, Cruz had failed, the Mercers were looking for a candidate, and they really wanted to defeat Hillary Clinton. And Trump was the last man standing, and they jumped in, said, we'll give you a couple million dollars, but you gotta hire our people. And they had their own political operatives who had been working with them. One was Steve Bannon, um, and another was Kellyanne Conway, who was running their uh, political, uh, outside political pack. And so their people and their money helped really sort of drag Trump over the finish line. At any point, did you get people to acknowledge the irony that these people who want to shrink government have made fortunes from government contracts? I, to me, I think it's a wonderful question. And it was, it's not just government contracts. I mean, one of the things that made Bob Mercer such a success, again, as I mentioned, was this, this, this work he did at IBM. And IBM didn't really fund it properly, and they needed more money, and they, it wasn't going to work unless they could find outside funding. And where did they go? The federal government. They went to the Defense Department, and mm -hmm. DARPA funded that, that mm -hmm. work that they did. And it was that success that then helped him, you know, be seen as someone to hire by Renaissance technology. So he owes the federal government lots. But for some reason, he, according to the people I interviewed who work with him, once said he wants to shrink the federal government down to the size of a pinhead. And he, he now says he doesn't think anybody should get government aid, um, that it coddles people, and that um, people need to make it on their own. Looking ahead, what have these people uh, that you've written about, what have they done to, to pass it on to the, to the next generation. We've talked about Rebecca Mercer, uh, don't know about the Kochs or others. What plans are there for these, their causes to outlive these individuals? Well, I mean, to, as far as passing it on to the next generation, one of the things that's, that's literally alive and in front of Congress that both the Kochs and the Mercers have pushed for is to get rid of estate taxes. You can then pass it on to the next generation without paying anything. And, and I, you know, I, I think that it's something. It's that, uh, you know, I really think 
in this country, we don't want to become an aristocracy where there's just one class that owns so much of the, the, the goods in this country and the wealth in this country, because it begins to destabilize the democracy if it gets too out of whack. Um, you know, you can, it's, it's hard to have one man, one vote, and everyone be politically equal when you have that kind of inequality going on. And so I worry about that. We're gonna go to our lightning round, a series of brief questions and brief answers uh, for Jane Mayer. First one is um, true or false. Uh, billionaire Bob Mercer was sued in 2013 by three of his household staff for failure to pay overtime as promised. This is true, but he had an excuse. He docked their wages because they hadn't followed his instruction to throw out every shampoo bottle when there was two-thirds or more used. Uh, true or false, when CIA Director Mike Pompeo was in the House of Representatives, he was known as the congressman from Coke. That is correct. True or false, the billionaires you have researched have compiled a dossier de detailing your darkest secrets. Well, at least they thought they were my darkest secrets. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to whether they... Um, uh, uh, true or false, you are related to Hollywood legend Louis Mayer, whose name is on this auditorium. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, single, this is a one-word answer. Uh, which American politician rose to power in the last century more fueled by oil money than any other? Probably Lyndon Baines Johnson. Didn't expect that one, did you? <laughs> uh, last question. If you could interview any one of the living billionaires in your book, Dark Money, which one would you choose? I really would love to talk to Charles Koch. I think he's a fascinating and a major figure in our politics. What, what is the vision of this radical um, libertarianism, where, where does it bring us? And it's one of the things you, you were asked who I'd want to talk to, Charles Koch. It's one of the questions I feel like nobody ever asks. What, what is your actual real world vision of what a world would look like with no government that, that regulates anything and no taxes? You know, I mean, is this, I mean, it, it sounds in some ways like, you know, the most failed states in Latin America, um, mm -hmm. where there's nothing but crime and sort of warlords. I, I, you know, where, where does this take us? And, and on the climate, you know, I, all I can conclude is that the Cokes are deeply devoted to their, co their company and to their bottom line. And, and, and so long as they can stave off a tax on carbon um, and keep the United States buying fossil fuels, they're making money. And it matters a lot to them. I'd like to thank our audience here at the Commonwealth Club of California in Silicon Valley and those listening online and on air. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Good night. Thank you.